Well, hello and welcome. Brother Peter Jeffrey here, Holly Grove Church, Brighton, Tennessee. And I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today as we open God's word and see what he has to say to us today. It is my hope and my sincere prayer that this message blesses you, challenges you, teaches you, but most of all, transforms you. I pray that this is just the beginning of a long conversation between you and God and another step on the journey that God is leading you on. Enjoy the message. May God bless you. And so that brings us to this series, and this may be the most important series that we will walk through this year. The series is called, What If Jesus Was Serious? And I know that sounds kind of like an odd title, but the concept for this series comes from a book that I read recently. You'll see the graphic up on the screen, most likely. Uh, and the book is called, What If Jesus Was Serious? I just lifted the title. I just stole it. There's a podcast that I listen to, and uh, one of the hosts on the podcast, his name is Sky Jatani. I love that name, Sky Jatani. And he is brilliant. He is a theologian. He's a professor. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. He speaks all over the country. And uh, he, he, uh, he tells a story in the intro to this book. The reason that he wrote this book, he was a young pastor just starting out his, his, at his first church. And they, they asked him if he would teach a class on Sundays. And he said, yes, I would love to. And so we pondered. And he decided he was going to teach a class and walk the people through the Sermon on the Mount. And if you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, it's found in the book of Matthew. It is uh, the longest recorded sermon that Jesus ever preached. It covers three chapters, five, six, and seven. Some of the most important and profound and life-changing teachings of Jesus are found in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord's Prayer comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And he read the whole thing through. It takes about 10 or 12 minutes. He read the Sermon on the Mount, and then he stopped and he asked them the question. He said, how many of you think Jesus actually expects us to live out these commands? Not a single hand went up. And so he recovered from his being shocked. And he said, well, well why is that? Why, why do you think that Jesus doesn't expect us to live out these commands? And, and one young woman said, well, because it's just impossible to obey. No one can live up to that standard. We can't live like this. Another young man spoke up and he said, well, Jesus didn't expect us to live like this. He was just showing us how we all need God's grace. He was illustrating what a perfect life looks like and how none of us can ever attain it. He said, I was thinking to myself the whole time, well, Jesus must have gathered this multitude then and set them on the side of a hill and, and preached these powerful truths all the while going, wink, wink, disciples, hey, don't pay too much attention to this because you're not really going to have to do it. And then he thought to himself, well, then, then how do you explain, if Jesus didn't expect us to live this way, how do you explain the way he closed this sermon? He closes his sermon with this. <clears throat> Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. That's a strong phrase. It means acts with one and the same mind and purpose as me. Those who imitate me perfectly. There, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains came and the winds blew and the house did not fall because it was built on a foundation of rock. And then, final words, he says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rains came and the winds blew and the house fell. And he says, and great was its fall. Amen. Thank you for coming. That really is kind of our experience today, isn't it? It's no secret we've been talking about this for a few months now. That we live in what is now a post-Christian society. Post-Christian culture. Our world has moved on past Christianity. Christian values are no longer important and vital to our communities. Christianity is dismissed. It is sometimes demeaned. It is sometimes ignored. And it makes me ask the question, how did we get there? How did we get to a post-Christian world? Well, for the last 40 years or so, Jesus followers, Christians, us, we've been told by the church 
Don't take Jesus too seriously or nobody will come. Let's focus not on harsh Jesus, on strong Jesus. Let's focus on kind Jesus, on shepherd Jesus, on Jesus as our therapist, Jesus as our encourager. We don't want to make church old and and stodgy and boring. We need church to be cool and hip and fun. We need to have water slides and Easter egg drops. We want people to praise Jesus, but we're not too concerned if they actually obey Jesus. We don't want challenging Jesus. We don't want higher standard Jesus. We don't want take up your cross Jesus. And so because of that, Christianity has lost its moral authority. It's lost its ability to speak into the culture. Christianity has largely lost its spiritual credibility. There was a study done about five years ago by a number of researchers from different companies and different disciplines. He studied the way Christians live, and the final statement in their study says, we conclude that Christians today are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world in general. The Barna Group, Christian researchers, did a similar study. And here's the closing sentence of their study. They said, American Christianity has largely failed since the middle of the 20th century because Jesus' modern-day disciples do not act like Jesus. This guy says in his book, he says, we get upset because the world sees us as hypocrites, but statistically, we are. But here's the deal. The world right now is hungry. The world right now is searching. The world is open spiritually like they haven't been in decades. And we have the antidote. We look around us, we see the chaos, we see the division, we see the strife, we see the lack of reality and common sense, and we have the answer. We we, we have the answer for all the anxiety and depression and chaos in this world. But we've moved our house from the rock to the sand. Sky says at the end of his introduction, he says, if we want the culture to take Jesus more seriously, maybe we should try it first. So, for the next several weeks, we're not going to preach through Sky's book, although I encourage you to pick it up. It is an easy read, and it's a great read. But we're not going to preach through the Sermon on the Mount. We'll do that some other time. But we're going we're gonna to look at some of, most, of Jesus' most famous teachings, some of his most challenging teachings, his most controversial teachings. And in every scenario, we're going to ask ourselves, like we're going to do today, what if Jesus was serious? And if he is, what does that look like for us to take Jesus seriously? What changes in our lives? What becomes different about the way we think? What becomes different about the way we move about in this world, the way we interact with people, the way that we live? Because as we look at these, we'll find that Jesus was and is serious about everything he said. So today, I want to start with part one. And I wanted to kind of throw you a softball a little bit. This, this, this teaching is, is very familiar, I think, to probably all of you. Because even those outside of a Christian context have probably heard of this concept, of this teaching. And it's found in Matthew 5. And it is, it, this one is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's Matthew 5, verses 38 through 42. Listen to what Jesus is preaching. You have heard, it, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today, and we need to pray about this one, because this is difficult. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it, that you really meant what you said. And so I pray right now, Jesus, that you would would be among us, that you would teach us like you taught those multitudes on the side of that hill, 
that, that you would lay us wide open so that we can, we can take in this truth and it can take root in our souls. That would indeed transform us the way it transformed those who heard that day. Lord, I pray for your blessing. I pray for your anointing. Your word would go forth powerfully today in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, this is uh, an excerpt from the Sermon on the Mount. And if you read through the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see this pattern occur six times where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. And when we read that, it kind of sounds like Jesus is dismissing or negating an Old Testament law because he always follows it up with an Old Testament law. It sounds like he's saying, no, that law was not right. That was, not, that was wrong. And so I'm going to tell you what's right. I'm going to replace it with something new. But that's not at all what Jesus is doing here. What he is doing is quoting what these people have heard their teachers say about that law. How they have presented it to them, how they have interpreted it. And Jesus is, is, is poking at them pretty hard right now. Because he says, your teachers have not been teaching you what this law really means. They have relaxed the law. They have watered down the law. They have broadened its meaning. And he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now, this is a very familiar concept to them. This is a principle that was very prevalent in their day. It's called the lex talionis. Lex talionis, the law of retaliation. And everyone in their culture, every country, every nation, every region had some version of the lex talionis. And when we, when we hear this, this phrase, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, it comes right out of the book of Exodus, by the way. It sounds kind of harsh to us because we're kind of taught not to do that. But actually, it was a law that was put in place out of compassion. Because in their semi-barbaric cultures of that day, they wouldn't just take an eye for an eye. They would, if you pluck out my eye, I kill you. If you steal one of my cows, I'm going to go and steal all of your cows. And so this was a check system. It's like, no, you don't get to do that. You don't have to go over and beyond. You just get in return what you lost. So they would have known about this. But it's a legal standard. It's meant to be used in a court, decided by a magistrate. And what the Pharisees had done is they've, they, they, they watered it down and applied it across the board. They made it a moral concept. They made it a personal and a relationship standard. If anybody looks at you crossways, well, get them. Just give them what they've got coming to them. Get what's yours. Jesus says, no. In God's kingdom, we don't live like that. An eye for an eye is fine for legal matters, not personal matters. We are called to a higher standard, a better way. And then Jesus drops the bomb. Verse 39, he says, You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. And we're like, seriously? But before you get too out of shape out of this, this is not, we'll tell you what it's not. It's not pacifism. Jesus is not preaching pacifism. Jesus is not saying, don't ever defend yourself. Jesus is not saying, sit idly by while you see your, your neighbor assaulted or your children murdered or you witness an armed robbery. It's not at all what he's saying. It's certainly not resist, do not resist the evil one, which is the devil. We're supposed to resist him. But this, this, this word evil one is, is an odd word. It's only used a couple of times in the Bible. And this word evil person literally means the pain-ridden one. We kind of know that concept, right? You've heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, do not take a position. Do not hold your ground. Take a position of retaliation in personal matters, in strife, and in conflict. Don't take a posture of retaliation against a pain-ridden person who decides today to take it out on you. Eye for an eye, Jesus says, does not apply. And so we ask, well, if we're, if we're not supposed to retaliate, what are we supposed to do? And Jesus immediately explains himself using four different scenarios. And each one of these scenarios is, is not a literal scenario. It's, it's, a, it's figurative. It's an illustration of a core concept that Jesus is getting at. 
So what I want to do in the next few minutes is I want to take us through all four of these scenarios. I want to explain what Jesus is really talking about here. And then after we look at those, we're going to find out that there is an absolutely mind-blowing truth that we're going to unlock that's behind and the foundation of all these things. So let's start with scenario number one. This is the most familiar, right? It's the turn the other cheek thing, right? We've all heard that. In fact, I heard a very prominent person in the business and political realm say the other day uh, that uh, we've been turning the other cheek for a long time, and where has that got us? We need to stop doing that. That's not what Jesus said. He says, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And Jesus is very specific. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek. So that means that you're either getting slapped by someone's left hand, which is very demeaning because in their day, the left hand was the, shall we say, toilet hand, if you get my drift. Or you're being backhanded with the right hand, which in a public setting would be disgraceful. So what Jesus is describing here is a picture of insult. When you are insulted, what do we do when we're insulted? Easy. We insult back. I mean, Lex Taliona says it's okay, right? Our world says we have the right to do this. Somebody comes at me, I'm going to come back at them. And actually, oftentimes, our inclination is to do even more. You come at me, I'm going to destroy you. May, reminded me of our, uh, Jesus teaching in the Lord's Prayer. This is why we have to pray about this. It's why, how, why we have to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's why we have to pray, Lord, lead us away from that kind of temptation. Don't let us fall into our natural inclination. Because if you return insult for insult, if you destroy the pain-ridden one, what have you accomplished? Nothing. Is your life better in any way? No. Do you feel better in any way? No. Is there any chance of reconciliation or healing? No. Have you in any way reduced that person's pain? No. So Jesus says, when you are insulted, turn your head and give them an invitation. Please, insult me on the other side. And then he gives us scenario number two. Verse 40, he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, then let him have your coat also. This is a picture that Jesus is painting of injustice. The first was insult. This is injustice. It's like, you want want what? You, You want my shirt? This is my shirt. It belongs to me. I made it. You can't have it. Oh, you're going to take me to court so that you can take my shirt? Well, lawyer up, buddy. We're going we're, we're gonna to do this. I'm going to have my day in court, my say in court. I'm going to have my way. But Jesus says, no. No. Give him your shirt. And then give him your cloak as well. And this is a big deal. Because in their time, you, you probably have more than one shirt. That's your inner garment. You probably have several shirts. You can get another one. But you only have one cloak. Your cloak is fancy. Your cloak is heavy. It's made out of wool. Your cloak not just just protects you during the day, but it's also your sleeping blanket at night. And Jesus says, invitation counters insult, but injustice is countered with generosity. Give them both. Give them more. So then we get to scenario number three, verse 41. It says, whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. And this was very familiar to them because it's a picture of indignity, of dehumanization, of oppression. And this is what they dealt with every day. They lived under Roman rule. <clears throat> and according to Roman law, if a Roman soldier was riding on a horse with a big heavy pack on it, if he decided that the horse needed to rest for a little while, he could get down off that horse, he could grab a Hebrew person, and he could say, here, carry this pack. My horse needs a rest. And you were obligated to carry that pack. But by law, he couldn't force you to go more than one mile. And then you could give it back and he could put it back on his horse. 
But this was very inconvenient, and it was very embarrassing, and it was very dehumanizing because you could be on your way. Your wife could have, made, could have sent you to the store to, just to pick up a few things, and you're walking on the way to the store, and all of a sudden, a Roman soldier says, hey, you, get over here. Carry this pack in that direction. And you have to walk with him a whole mile. And then you could just give the pack back, and he'd say, okay, thanks for the help. And then you'd have to walk all the way back to get to where you were going. Unless there was another Roman soldier there, and he decided his horse needed a rest too. In that case, you'd have to walk another mile, and maybe even three or four. And before you knew it, you were so far away from where you originally intended to go, and you couldn't do anything about it. But Jesus says, don't mutter under your breath. Don't curse the Roman soldier. Don't resist and tell him you don't want to do it. Don't complain about it the whole time. Don't steal his sword and try to stab him in the back. Go with him one mile. And when that mile is up, he says, okay, you can give me back my pack. You say, no, I'm good. Your horse looks a little more tired than me today. Let's go another one. Change the dynamic, Jesus says. Impact the narrative. Retaliate against insult with invitation, against injustice with generosity, and against indignity by taking the posture of a servant. And then, scenario number four. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Jesus here is being sneaky. He's being underhanded. Like, Jesus, why did you have to go there? Because he's taking this, this us and them mentality, and he's turning it around. Now you're the them, and that person who is in need is the us comes to you and says, I, look, man, I, I really need, I'm in need. Could, could you help me out here? And oftentimes our response is, well, man, you're getting what you deserve. You're getting what you earn. You should have taken better care of your money. And Jesus says, no. He says, I know that you live under oppression every day. I know you suffer insult all the time and injustice and indignity. I know that you're taken advantage of, but it doesn't give you the right to ignore or dismiss or take advantage of someone else in a lower position than you. Don't pass on the inequity that you receive. Don't perpetuate the pain. Counter insult with invitation. Counter injustice with generosity, indignity with servanthood, and counter inequity with compassion. This is the way of the kingdom, Jesus says. This is God's principle of retaliation. This is what it looks like, Jesus says, to follow me seriously. And we say, seriously, Jesus? Why? Why? Why, why? why is eye for an eye not good enough? Why isn't the regular law of retribution good enough? Why can't we just poke them in the eye and punch them in the nose and be done with it? Jesus, it feels like you want us to be the eternal, everlasting doormats of the whole world. If we take this seriously, Jesus, it feels like people will just walk all over us for the rest of our lives. But Jesus is serious. And he's serious for a good reason. Here is the secret foundational underlying truth that's hidden away in this teaching. Jesus is not restraining you. Jesus is not limiting you. Jesus is not saying, oh, 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 remember, if someone hurts you, don't forget to be nice. Uh, just respond in love. Don't, don't hit back. Uh, just always have a kind word. No. Jesus is not taking anything away from us. He's giving something to us. What is that thing he's giving us? Jesus is giving you power. He's giving you power. The most valuable commodity that you can have in this world. Power to live. Power that will sustain you. Power to conquer over evil. Power to overcome your enemies and to overcome in the most oppressive circumstances. Power that will work in every kind of scenario, in any kind of environment. Power to do the good that God wants done in this world. Think about this. If somebody wrongs you, what do you feel? You feel powerless. So you strike back so that you can regain some of the power that you perceive you've lost. But when you do, you shrink down to the lowest common denominator. You shrink down to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and you become just exactly like your oppressor. 
You have lost the ability to tip the scales, to impact the situation for good. You have abdicated your power. The Jews were living under this tyrannical dictatorship of a government. They were spit on every day. They were belittled and abused and oppressed constantly. But Jesus says, don't give up your power. When you turn the other cheek, when you give the extra garment, when you go the extra mile, you're saying, you may have the power to insult or oppress me, but you don't have the power to control me. You cannot stop me from doing good to you. You may be able to impact me in the moment, but I'll impact you for a lifetime. Jesus demonstrated this in his own life more than once. If you look at John chapter 18, we see this scenario of Jesus getting arrested and detained. Now remember, right before this scenario, he had shared with his his disciples, he said, I want you to know that that all power in heaven and earth has been restored to me. All authority, all power has been given back to me. So in this scene, this multitude of people comes to him. It was soldiers, it was priests, it was Pharisees. They're coming with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Jesus was not afraid. Jesus went out to meet them. And he said, whom do you seek? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And the instant that he spoke the words, I am, it says they drew back and fell to the ground. I ask you, who has all the power in this scenario? They drew back and they fell to the ground. They gathered themselves and they stood up again. And he asked them again, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I told you, I am he. And at that moment, the strangest thing happens. It says, Peter, having a sword. Where in the world did Peter get a sword? Why, what's a fisherman doing with a sword? Where did he get it? Why does he have it? What does he expect that he's going to do with it? But it says, Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave, cut off his right ear. Now, this was not surgical precision. This is not Peter saying, I got your ear, you cross me again, I'll get your other ear. No, Peter's not nearly that good. Peter was aiming to cut the head off of that servant. And he just wasn't very good at it. Jesus picks up the man's ear, puts it back on and heals him. And then he turns to Peter As if to say, Peter, why? Why did Peter swing the sword? It's because he felt powerless. Here's a multitude coming at him with weapons, and he he felt totally powerless. He thought by cutting off somebody's head, he could gain some power back. But Jesus says, Peter, we don't do things that way. Put the sword back in the sheath. And then he says this, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, they have the power to detain me, but they cannot stop me from doing the good that I was sent to do. I will drink the cup. I have the power to drink the cup that they can't. And that's exactly what happened. They falsely accused him. He didn't say a word. They tried him. He didn't say a word. They beat him. He never struck back. They mocked him. He said nothing. They nailed him to a cross with his hands and his feet. They assigned to him the death of utmost humiliation. And he went the extra mile. He prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And you say, aha, there, there. Jesus had no power in that moment. And you would be wrong. Yes, Jesus had power when he was raised from the dead. He was powerful in his resurrection. But Jesus displayed the greatest act of power in human history. When he was hanging on that cross and he cried out, it is finished. He said, no one has the power to take my life from me. I have the power to lay it down of my own accord. You may have the power to put me on this cross, but no one has the power that can stop me from redeeming the entire world. You may have the power to impact me right now here today, but I have the power to impact the whole world for all eternity. So you might say it this way. God so loved the world 
that he turned the other cheek. God so loved the world that he gave the extra garment. God so loved the world that he went an extra mile and another and another and another. And he did not turn us away when we were in need. For God so loved you that he turned his, his other cheek to you. God so loved you that, that, that he's going the extra mile for you right now. And he'll go an extra mile for you tomorrow. And he'll go an extra mile for you the next day. And the next day and the next day. God never runs out of extra miles. He never runs out of extra garments. He never runs out of cheeks to turn on your behalf. He never runs out of resources to give you. Even though you come to him time and time again in need and want to borrow and need things from Jesus, he never turns you away. That's what Jesus is teaching us in this section right here. When we turn the other cheek, we say, you may be able to insult me, but you don't have the power to define me. You don't have the power to make me strike you back. You don't have the power to make me walk away. When we give up our shirt and then give up our cloak, we, may, we say, you may be able to take some things from me, but you don't have the power to stop me from being generous to you. You don't have the power to take my soul, my peace, to take my joy. When we go the extra mile, we say, you may be able to inconvenience me, belittle me. You may be, have the, you may be able to oppress me, but you don't have the power to control me. You can't stop me from serving you. You may annoy me. You may exhaust me. You may deplete me, but you don't have the power to stop me from being compassionate toward you. You may think you have power. But you don't have the kind of power that I have. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Power to what? Power to be my witnesses. Witnesses to what? Witnesses to the love of God. Witnesses to the salvation of Jesus. To the redemption of the world. Witnesses to God's mercy and his grace. Witnesses to, I'm just a nobody. Trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. You have the power. But you don't get that power from an eye for an eye. You don't get that power for insult for insult. You don't get that power by taking a posture of retaliation against a pain-ridden person who insults you, who takes what is yours, who oppresses you, who, who, who needs something from you. That kind of power only comes when we take Jesus seriously. We turn the other cheek. We give the extra garment. We go the extra mile. We supply the extra need. When we counter insult with invitation, injustice with generosity, indignity with servanthood, and inequity with compassion. As I was putting this whole thing together this week, of course, that's what happens when you prepare a message. You preach to yourself all week long. <clears throat> And I don't think there's a one of us in this room or online that is not convicted in some way right now, including me. But I was wrestling with a situation. I had this relative on my in-law side because nobody on my side would ever act this way. <laughs> but I have this relative, and uh, I'm friends with him on the social medias. And he's been through a lot in the last several years. Just heart-wrenching. And it's turned his whole world upside down. Never saw it coming. Still doesn't quite know how to deal with things. And when I would see his posts come across my timeline, at, at first his posts were, were, were just kind of confused. How difficult life is. People are judging me and they're hypocritical and I feel mistreated. But lately he's gotten angry gotten combative. He's posting a lot of anti-religious content, especially anti-Jesus content. And, and some of it is just absolutely abhorrent. It is blasphemous. It is I, I fear for his soul kind of stuff. So I've been tempted many times to follow my natural inclination, which is to I clap back and to, uh, to stomp him into the ground and demonstrate my obvious theological superiority. But I, I didn't. So I thought, well, I'll just block him. I'll just unfriend him. I'll just get rid of him. And God said, no, no, don't do that. And then I see Jesus teaching. And I see that he really is a pain-ridden one. 
that he's not angry, he's hurting. And I still feel compelled, drawn to respond. And I don't really want to, but I'm probably going to. And when I do, what I think is going to happen is God's going to tell me, you need to respond in love. You need to respond with encouragement. You need to respond with grace. You need to give him your other cheek. You need to go the extra mile. Will it make a difference? I have no idea. But I know that it will be powerful. Because he may hate my faith right now. He may hate everything I stand for and live for. But he doesn't have the power to stop me from speaking goodness into his life. That's the power of God's principle of retaliation. We are never called to suffer abuse. We're, we're never called to not defend ourselves when we, are, when we are assaulted or in harm's way. We do seek justice at the appropriate time when justice is called for. But person to person, we take Jesus seriously and we go the kingdom way because the kingdom way is the way of power. Let's stand. I know that there are many here today. And the whole idea of turning your other cheek and going an extra mile is very tough. Some of you have suffered more abuse than I can even imagine. Sometimes this feels like, well, I got to go through more. No. I want you to know that Jesus wants to give you power. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you himself. For others of you, the idea of giving the shirt and the cloak seems so backwards. And it might be because you're hurting too. That there's pain in your life that you've not given to Jesus and he's not healed it. Maybe you're the person that other people need to turn their cheek toward. Whatever the case, Jesus is the answer. And if you've never crossed the line of faith, if you've never, never stepped into new life in a relationship with Jesus, if you've never given him your life, you can do that right now, wherever you are around the room, around the country. You can give your life to Jesus right now. You can step into his kingdom. You can, you can live the way Jesus always designed you to live. And all you have to do is pray one simple sentence. And if that's you and you're ready to cross the line of faith, you're ready to give Jesus your life, that's all you have to say. You just say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. If you're struggling with what Jesus had to say, you can pray the same prayer. Say, Jesus, I don't want to turn the other cheek. I don't want to go an extra mile. I don't want to give to somebody who needs from me. But I'm going to take you seriously. And I give you my life that you can work it out in me. We're going to sing just a verse in the chorus of this little song. And as we do, make this your prayer today. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Sing that part again. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. 
change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. here and I pray Father that you would go with us today go with us because we'll need you to go with us because as sure as the day is long we will encounter pain ridden people yes they will insult us they will impose upon us. Yes, they will indignify us. Help us to respond with power. With the power that says you cannot stop me from doing good in your life. Change our hearts, oh God. May we be like you. Go with us today. In Jesus' name, amen.